I just wanted to spend a little bit of time before passing over to Anthony um, on providing a bit of an introduction to this afternoon's session. Um, this, this morning we had three really interesting presentations from um, different, different sectors and different people with different messages and I just wanted to share with you a couple of things that I noted down which I saw as being perhaps major issues that uh, are coming out of what we're discussing. So, for example, looking at Peter's presentations, it's quite clear that the mechanisms for sharing data and the mechanisms for getting data out there are there, but just perhaps we're not using them effectively. And the data isn't being fed into these mechanisms in, in, as, as far as it could be. And then looking at um, Claire's presentation, these regional studies um, that were coming out of the actual wind farm industry are clearly quite dramatically advancing our understanding of our political potential as a sea base. But a lot of it's happening through consent. So how do we get the data out there early? How do we get the data out to the public domain before we then you get to the point where we're needing to use oasis forms and the ADS and at the end of the project where we're looking at archiving? We need to take it beyond the site of the view. That was a key message that came out of Claire's presentation, that you know, we need to be looking at things in as much more of these regional scales. And also um, working collaboratively, collaboratively with um, other disciplines, making sure that we're not isolating ourselves as archaeologists, but we are drawing upon the information that's available to us out there from the wide range of people that are using the seabed. And finally, looking at Pip's presentation, I think one of the key messages that came out there was your comment about the future, so where do we go from here? But the fact that we want more and varied collaboration, we need updates to our standard processes, such as the model clauses, the WSI model clauses. We want to get more data. Um, so this is all looking forward to the future. So the point of this discussion this afternoon is really to look at where we are and where we want to go from here. So. I thought it might be worth just spending a little bit of time just very briefly looking at the journey of how we got here. But if we look at the terrestrial side first, so in the 1950s and 60s there were a lot of very high profile excavations which um, had a lot of uh, local interest and national, ultimately a national interest where archaeological sites were being destroyed which led in the 1970s to us getting a lot more funding from the government for what we called at that time rescue archaeology. This saw a big wide body of professional archaeologists coming um, onto the market to be able to provide these services. Um, and then there was obviously the high profile case in 1989 of the Rose Theatre, which basically stem, uh, prompted the formulation of PBG 16, and in 1990, when we had the planning guidance, planning policy guidance 16 released, England was really seen as leading the way in Europe at this point, because it wasn't until the year after that we got the Valletta Convention, which really for the first time sort of pan-Europe introduced archaeology into the planning system and this concept of kind of the, the, the developer pays for all the archaeology work that goes on. So we also then after that had PPG 15, which dealt with the wider historic environment and buildings in 1994. And then moving into consolidating all of this planning policy into the NPPF in 2012. So we, we can see from this journey that really since the 1950s and 60s in terrestrial archaeology, there's been a real drive to get things moving. There's been funding from the government. There's been um, numerous documents produced which are focused on how we can deal with development-led archaeology as part of that planning system. On the marine side, in 1986, that was the first time that the government made any funding available for marine archaeology. And that was for establishing the Archaeological Diving Unit at the University of St Andrews. But even then, they only made funding available to have the group there to actually look at the protected wrecks. They didn't make any funding available for survey, for excavation, for conservation, publication. And then in 1989, we have, by the time we get to 1989, we've got JNAPC established, the volunteer organisation looking to push forward the um, maritime archaeology in the general sphere. And also the NAS, another volunteer organisation. These are not people that have got professional funding. These are not people funded by developers. These are groups who are all volunteers. 
So at the same time as we were getting PPG-16 on the terrestrial side, everything in marine archaeology was still run by volunteers, or progressed by volunteers. It wasn't until 2001 we got the UNESCO Convention. But the important thing is, the last uh, marine archaeology group session we had a couple of years ago at the CEPA conference, we talked very long and hard about how uh, England should, or the UK should ratify the UNESCO Convention. They still haven't signed. We're not a party member to that convention on underwater cultural heritage. Finally, in 2002, somebody actually gives responsibility to Historic England for the marine environment. So we are just starting to move forwards, but this wasn't until 2002. And with the, two, with the Marine Coastal Access Areas Act in 2009, that finally marine archaeology becomes part of the marine planning system. And then in 2011, we have our own sort of NPPS, the Marine Environment and Marine Policy Statements. But you can see from this that the trajectories have been very different. We haven't had the same funding, we haven't had the same guidance, the same in, uh, sort of timescale. So we're still operating in a very, well, it's a very, very new world. We haven't been doing the planning system as long as on the terrestrial side. So I guess it's not a, such a surprise that we might necessarily be a little bit behind the game in that respect. When I was looking at what I was going to say at this part of this introduction, I found the Historic England document, Building the Future, Transforming Our Past. This was written in 2015, um, and basically a celebration of development-led archaeology from 1990, PPG 16, to 2015. It had the, all the famous sites we know, talk, they talked about, the Andrew Archer, the um, the work in the Cambridgeshire Must Farm, Ed, the Edsley Elephant, all the work that was done at Kingsmead Quarry, and many, many more examples of all this wonderful development and archaeology that had happened. But how many marine examples were in that document? Yeah. One. And there was one paragraph on this one site, which was London Gateway and the discovery of the London, which isn't even exactly our best example of how to do marine archaeology well. So this is the only example in something that was celebrating development-led archaeology. So where do we go from here? Another thing I picked up from the Historic England document was this statement that the system reduces risks for developers, ensures that important information about our history is not lost without record, and yields significant public benefits. We all agree with that. But what does it say in the document? It says that it works because everyone plays their part. So how does that work in our world, in, our, in marine archaeology? We have marine archaeology units. We've got Wessex Coastal Marine. We've got MSDS Marine. We've got um, some activity at Cotswolds. So Cotswolds do have a marine archaeology section. And we've got Marine Archaeology Limited. When you compare four to the wide body of terrestrial marine uh, terrestrial archaeology units that are out there, why do we have so few? It's not like we're not busy. <laughs> marine heritage consultants. There's me at Royal Haskell and DHV and my colleague D. There's um, Dan at RPS, and there's a few more sort of marine heritage consultants scattered around. But essentially, there's still not very many of us out there. The developers also play their part. Now, we've seen from the presentations this morning that industries like the aggregates industry, the offshore wind industry, the developers are actually really progressive in how they deal with marine archaeology. They're very positive. They, they are very keen to get involved and to um, provide funding and to support the works that they need to do, as long as they have to do it. But that's, as we know, that's the question we always get asked. But some other developers' sectors are not quite so supportive. There, perhaps the ports and harbour sector could be a little bit more productive in how they re respond to the work that we need to do. But essentially, the developers are beginning to get much better. But the landowners also have a responsibility in this respect as well. well and here, but particularly dealing with the Crown Estates. So, so should, should they, they be playing, playing their role as well in anything that we do? do. The important thing is as well, well is historic England. England. At the, At the end, end of the day, day the marine planning team in historic England has three people. people. So, so how can we expect uh, a, the support that we need as consultants, as archaeologists from Historic England, if they've only got three people dealing with every single marine plan and marine project that's around the coast of the UK? 